As an additional reminder, I have changed that homework's due date to be next Monday. But we will take a look at any questions you guys have. Just to load up the website. This question shows two people trying to move a horse, which normally does not go very well. Um, <coughs> consider, bless you. Thank you. It will consider the mule, actually, to be the object being pulled. And there are two different forces being exerted upon it. Your force numbers will vary, but the two forces will point in two known directions. Force one, 60 degrees above the x-axis and the other 75 degrees above the negative x axis. And these two forces are both pulling on the mule. And the first question we're asked is, what, find a single force that is equivalent to the two forces shown. That is a technical way of asking for you to add the two force vectors together to figure out what the combined effort of these two humans is. So to do that, we have two force vectors that will each need to be broken down into their components. To be able to be added together. <coughs> Bless you. Now the number for each hypotenuse will vary, but you will have the hypotenuse and one angle, so sine and cosine will be able to inform you of what the component legs are. I'll call this F2Y, F1, sorry, F2X, F1X, F1Y. So each of these hypotenuses will need to be broken down into corresponding xy components for each vector. The x's will need to be added together and the y's will need to be added together. So f1x, f1y, plus f2x, f2y, to create the component form of their vector sum. Now, the exact numbers that you have will vary slightly. I believe, based on the drawing, I don't know, my F1 is much larger than F2. Your number, your answers will probably vary as to whether or not your X ends up being positive or negative, but no matter positive or negative for X, it's important to note the two X legs work against one another. The two y's work in favor of each other. They're both pulling in the positive y. So ultimately, the teamwork of these two people should be trying to pull the mule forward. Uh, the x's will work against each other and add up to a number closer to zero. Uh, you will have to actually make one of the two x's negative yourself, because your calculator doesn't know the context of the question. Before you add the vector together, one of the x's needs to be negative. I would personally make it F2's x component, just because it points in the typically negative x direction. But ultimately, after you add these two components together, it should give you the components to form a new hypotenuse. So let's call that 
sigma fx and sigma fy. And to input your final answer, whatever your components here are, the component form, you'll have to use those components to find their magnitude and direction form. Does that help so far? Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing particularly with WebAssign is it's always very persnickety about the perspective of the angle of the answer. Note here it says some number of degrees counterclockwise from the x-axis. That would mean starting at positive x, rotating counterclockwise, which is standard for kind of how most people draw angles on unit circles. Where things get a little weird is actually in part B. Because here it asks, find the force a third person would have to exert on the mule to make the net force equal to zero. So, finish part A first is my recommendation. Get your complete correct answer for part A, because that will determine what your answer to part B is. These two humans are pulling together, and it's asking if a third person were to show up and want to be very rude, what direction and what force would a third person have to pull in to completely negate their efforts? If a third person could exert a force to make the net force zero, what direction would it be and what amount of force would it be? Um, so for part B, the directions, do you see the third person being on the other side, so on the other side of the wheel? So that just 180 degrees from the first angle? Exactly. Whatever your answer for A's angle is, B's angle will be 180 degrees away. For example, if your two, if your two forces add up to something that looks like this, then the third person who comes in to try to oppose would pull directly opposite 180 degrees away. So from first quadrant to third quadrant. And the only numerical difference between your answer to A and B would be adding 180 degrees to your angle because they need to use the same amount of force just in the opposite direction. Does that help? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I understand the magnitude. Can you explain the direction again? Yes. Direction would be the angle that the hypotenuse is pointing in. So for part for part A? No, for, for B. Oh, okay. Well, the answer to B depends on the answer to A. Mm -hmm. So A is asking what is the direction of the sum of these two vectors? And add the components together, use the components to form hypotenuse and direction. So this angle here on this new sum triangle is the answer to A's direction. B's direction, the entire point of B is, looking at your answer to A, this is the total sum of the first two people's work, B is asking what magnitude of direction a third person has to use to completely counter it. Now, if the two people were pulling this way, and someone else wanted to negate their work, you just pull in the exact opposite direction. So x to negative x, y to negative y. Here, you take the angle you got in part A, and to make it the exact opposite angle, you add 180. You're gonna do half a full rotation to get to the opposite direction. Okay, I'm glad. Might be a dumb question, but why couldn't we just add together um, the F1 and the F2 to get that more equivalent, uh, to get the equivalent of F2? That is, in a way, what you're doing. The, the problem is that these two vectors, they're pointing in two different directions, and so you cannot add them directly to one another because, I mean, they're they're not entirely X and they're not entirely Y. You've got to figure out 
how much of each of those two vectors is in the y and is in the x to determine how much they're working together in the y and how much they're working against each other in the x. Um, as an additional example, let's change the perspective a little bit. Let's say two people, bless you, are just trying to pull an inanimate box. These two people can exert 10 newtons apiece. In this version, they're both pulling straight forwards, but in this version, they're both pulling slightly outwards. Which one is more effective for pulling the box in this direction? The left one, because they are both completely working in unison in the same axis. But here, some of their efforts are opposing one another. And you have to divide it up into its components to figure out how much of that effort is basically going to waste. Now, if they were both in the same axis, yes, just add them together. Sadly, these two chose the hard way. Well, frankly, they chose the hard way when they decided to pull the needle around, but I didn't write the question. Does that help? How are we feeling? Any more questions about the homework bulk loader? Alright. So this again is the chapter three assignment. This and the chapter three quiz are now due Monday at midnight. Uh, so work on them the weekend. We can talk about it again in class on Monday just to make sure everyone's set on it before it's due. Yes. Is chapter four also due on Monday? It is not, because we won't be done with chapter four by that. I, I've attempted to hint at this before. Chapter 4 always takes longer than I think it does, and I'm trying to account for that this time, because there's lots of different types of force that we need to talk about. So, 3's homework is due this coming Monday, 4's is the one after that, the 26th. Okay. I do recommend you look at 4, but 3's due first. Prioritize that one. Needs, concerns, silly questions, or unsilly questions. All right. Again, please interrupt me at any time with any concerns. Uh, today, to continue on in chapter four, there's a specific scenario I'd like to work through with you guys because I mentioned last time normal force and gravity are very frequently connected, but they are not always equal and opposite. And this scenario currently on the board is the primary place where they are not equal nor opposite, and a ramp question like this has its own required set of steps and logic that I want to demonstrate for you before we do them in the lab next week. So this is the main example we're going to look at today. So this is a ramp question. There will be a few different varieties of ramp question, but this is the most straightforward scenario. Here we have a box sitting on an incline, and we're going to treat this incline as completely frictionless, which doesn't really happen in real life, but in physics we like to ignore friction whenever we can. Here there will be no friction. I'm trying to make this as straightforward a ramp example as we can. The ramp sits at 20 degrees, and there's a box sitting on its surface. box has a mass of 10 kilograms. Now, from your own experience of existing on planet Earth, if you set something on a slick, frictionless ramp, do you expect it to stay there? No, it's going to slide. In what direction is it going to slide? 
down, very good, not a trick question. And the reason for that, the reason that happens is because of a very weird interaction between gravity and normal force on an incline like this. So I'm holding it up to draw on top of the picture. Okay, feel free, I encourage you to put your own arrows all over the picture in your own notes. We're going to analyze the forces acting on this box and see what ends up happening as a result of them. What force, assuming this takes place on planet Earth, all logic that you know of from the real world applies in this case, what forces must be present on this box as it sits here? Gravity. Gravity. Very good. Can't escape it. It will always exert a force straight down on every object of mass. So gravity's going to be there. We can even figure out what that force of gravity is since we know that we're on Earth and we know the mass of the box. So we can determine its weight. We'll definitely have weight. What other forces would be present in this situation? All correct. Whoever said normal, whoever said ramp, both the different terms applying to the same thing here. Box is sitting on the ramp, and it's not falling straight through the ramp. So clearly the ramp is pushing up on the box, and that's keeping the box from just being in free fall. The question, though, is what direction is normal force going to point in? here? Getting some raised eyebrows and some people tilting their hands in different directions. That's good. It means you're, you know what's happening here. As discussed on Wednesday, normal force is called normal force because of the math definition meaning perpendicular. A surface can only create normal force perpendicular to itself, meaning on this ramp, this ramp physically cannot create normal force that points straight up. Instead, it has to point perpendicular to its own surface. So what I'm doing here is I'm just showing this is the incline of the ramp. Normal force is coming perpendicularly out of it. Those two, the two forces currently present here, normal force and gravity, do not point in complete, excuse me, do not point in completely opposite directions. They also are not going to be equal in magnitude. Let me go ahead and promise you that. As a result of both of those things, they're not equal and they're not opposite, these two forces cannot add up to zero right now. And that means the box is going to accelerate. If net force is zero, you don't accelerate. But if net force isn't zero, you will accelerate. And this is why things slide down ramps. On a flat surface, normal force can perfectly oppose gravity, so it does, and they cancel out. On an incline, it physically can't cancel out gravity, and as a result, their vector sum ends up pointing this way. So gravity straight down added to normal force that points forward slightly. Gravity does cancel out with the mostly vertical portion of normal force, but that means there's some portion pointing this way that gravity physically can't negate. And that's why the box slides this way. That sliding, the net force that draws stuff down inclines is the leftover piece after gravity and normal force add together, but don't completely cancel out. How does this feel so far? It's okay if it's shaky. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you some math and show you some more examples. 
I want to I want to demonstrate this now before it before we use it in lab next week. This becomes more pronounced. This effect becomes more pronounced at very low angles and very high angles. So I'm going to kind of draw a quick picture for each. At a very low angle, like an incline you barely notice, this is like walking up a very slight grade on a hill. You barely even notice it, unless you saw like a marble rolling down it probably. On very small inclines like this, gravity points straight down and normal force will point mostly straight up. So in low angles like this, normal force is better able to oppose gravity and they will mostly cancel out to the point where the rolling or the sliding is either minimal or negated by the friction we're ignoring for right now. At very high angles though, like to the point where it might as well be a vertical wall, Gravity points down, normal force would point. I'm going to redraw this actually. Gravity points down, normal force would almost be horizontal in this situation. As a result, you will slide down very fast because the normal force literally can barely fight gravity. You'll just be pulled almost straight down. So again, the sliding down ramp is due to the weird angle interaction between normal force and gravity not completely canceling and whatever piece is left over pushing you down the ramp. How big that piece is will depend on what the elevation of the ramp is. At smaller angles, they mostly cancel. Big angles, they hardly cancel at all. So is that why like, for exercise they say it's better to do like, a slight um, angle because of the force of gravity and the normal force being is putting more pressure on your body to kind of work on it? To make it? You, yes, you're on the right track. I just might describe that a little bit differently. That is correct though. Uh, I would describe that as at a slight elevation you have to do more work against gravity, and that takes more energy. And if a human uses more energy, you burn more physical calories and you use your muscles more. Correct. I would just use different words for that. And that's probably why literally climbing a ladder is harder. That's why literally climbing a ladder is harder than walking horizontally. So an angle is just Climbing an angle is just somewhere between those two extremes. <clears throat> Feeling all right for now? Okay. So the question that we're going to answer here is, for the original ramp and these numbers, what will the box's acceleration down the ramp be? We know it's going to slide, and we will be able to figure out the acceleration that it will slide with. And it is specifically an acceleration. Net force won't be zero here. If net force isn't zero, there will be an acceleration as a result. So again, to apply real world logic to this, if you have a slight incline and you set a marble on it, it's going to start rolling faster and faster and faster until something stops it. It doesn't roll with constant speed. That's because it is accelerating because there is a net force that isn't zero. And I'm going to step you through how we would find the acceleration in such a case. So, let's list what we know and what we don't know. We do have mass of the box, 10 kilograms. Since we have mass, and since we know that this is happening on Earth, where little g is negative 9.8, we can figure out what the force of gravity is. We can determine a number for that, so I'm going to list it as a variable. We know it's going to be present, so it'll be good to have a number for it. 
We know that normal force will be present, although we don't fully know what that normal force is yet. We know it will be there, though. And we know the elevation, the angle, sorry, of the incline, 20 degrees. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we've been asked for net acceleration down the ramp. And to go ahead and help you determine, like work on your frameworks for how these types of questions work. To find net acceleration, we're gonna employ Newton's second law, which says net force equals mass times net acceleration. Which means that to get this answer, we're gonna need to find net force. We don't really know what normal force is, but we need to know what it and gravity add up to. Because that vector sum force is gonna point down the ramp, and that's what's gonna push the object specifically down the ramp parallel to its slope. So I'm gonna add net force to our list of things we're interested in. question marks on this list. We're going to get to all of them, I swear. However, we can already figure out what Fg is. We have the information to find this number and we're going to need this number because this is one of the two forces that create net force in this scenario. So, we need an answer for Fg before we can continue. How do you find the weight of an object? Correct. So Fg equals m times g. Our mass is 10 kilograms. It's already in kilograms, so we don't have to convert it from grams. So 10 times negative 9.8 will give us negative 98 newtons downwards. know what force of gravity is. That's very good. Now, to proceed from here, this is where some unique logic is going to need to be employed. I'm going to show you all of that logic. You're not going to have to make these assumptions yourself. What we need is net force. We need to know net force to figure out net acceleration. The net force is going to be the sum of force of gravity and normal force. Now we know what force of gravity is, we just found it, but we don't know what normal force is. All we really know about normal force is an idea of what direction it's pointing in. We don't actually have a number for it yet. And since this isn't a flat horizontal ramp, flat horizontal surface, normal force is not directly opposing gravity, it's not just gonna be the same number here. So determining what normal force is and its relationship to the net force down the ramp is going to take a, a specific triangle. And maybe you've used something like this in a previous science class, but I'm going to draw a triangle for you now that is critical for working these types of problems. We don't know what normal force is, but we do know what gravity is, and we do know the angle of the slope. And we know whatever normal force is, it adds with gravity to create the net force down the ramp. So we know what direction the net force points. Specifically, we know the net force is going to be perpendicular to the normal force. Normal force comes perpendicular out of the ramp, 
And every object you've ever seen on an incline has always slid parallel down the slope. So we don't know what value for net force is, but we do know the direction it points in, down the ramp. And as a result of that, net force is perpendicular to normal force, and net force is formed by the sum of normal force and gravity, those three vectors end up forming a right triangle, simply because normal force and net force have to be perpendicular for this to work. Now, it's an odd triangle because gravity ends up being the hypotenuse. But that means we already know the hypotenuse, which we can use to determine what the other two sides are. And we also already know the angle, because we know the ramp inclines 20 degrees. The weird part is that the 20 degrees actually goes here. It's the angle between normal force and gravity. I find this is the this triangle and that particular angle relationship there is what can trip students up the most if they've never seen this before. And so it's a weird relationship that creates this phenomenon. And I am informing you that this is how this works. Coming to like when I was a student. It took me a while to understand why this was. To start doing the questions, it helps to just copy this down and use it like a tool, and why it works will begin to make sense with time and practice. But right now, you can consider the shape of this triangle and the guarantee that it works me the, the, the tool to use on these types of questions. And I promise you that this angle on this relationship triangle between gravity, normal force, and net force, that this is where the 20 degrees goes. And it actually, again, I showed, earlier I showed like, the difference between a high slope and a low slope to kind of inform what this reality was. On a low slope, gravity and normal force are mostly parallel to each other. And so on this low slope, with a very low theta value there, the triangle would look something like this. There'd be a very low angle between the normal force side and the gravity side. On a very steep triangle, gravity points down, normal force points that way. Very steep theta there, and this triangle would have a very steep change relationship between, yikes, I hear this weird. Those need to be perpendicular, so gravity points Okay, that's better. Very steep angle between normal force and gravity. If I'm, I'm basically just dragging the gravity line from where I originally drew it to the tip of the normal force line. So drag gravity over here, and the net force forms the blank between them. So getting to this is literally just taking all the forces here and rearranging them into that triangle. They're already pointing in the right directions, just gotta assemble it. Um, so does that angle always go between uh, normal force and gravity? Yes, uh, that's my intent of showing the extreme size triangles to demonstrate that. Because again, on this very slow, very low slope, there is not that big a difference between normal force and gravity, and so the angle between them is very small. But on this big slope here, there's a very big difference between normal force and gravity, so that bigger angle is shown in that triangle. 
Notice again, normal force is parallel to the slope each time. Yes? Uh, when I did the uh, calculate, or are you getting the calculation? Yes. Okay. What this means for our attempt to find net force is that we can use this triangle as in trigonometry to determine net force geometrically rather than having to go through the steps of having to add normal force and gravity together. Since they point in very different directions, we may, if we didn't use this trick, we'd have to go through the steps of breaking normal force down into its components to then add it to gravity, which you can do, but this shortcut requires fewer steps. We can just use the trick once to determine what the net force is, and we already know what direction it points in. So this, the shape of this triangle lets us skip a few steps and just use the trig on the, two, on the two pieces of information we know to skip to what net force is. But we could also use it to find the value of net uh, normal force, excuse me, because that number will be needed sometimes. This triangle is just the key relationship between all three of these pieces of information on a ramp. Now this is only true for ramps, because on flat surfaces, normal force and gravity just oppose one another. The angle between them is zero, and they cancel out. This is only what you have to do for an incline question. And to demonstrate finding that force, We know Fg, which is technically the hypotenuse of this triangle. We know 20 degrees, we're interested in net force. So from this label 20 degrees, net force would be opposite and Fg is hypotenuse. So that's sine. Sine equals opposite of the hypotenuse. So sine of 20 degrees, going to equal our net force divided by the value of our hypotenuse, the value of the force of gravity, which we've determined to be 98 newtons down. Sigma f would be 98 times the sine of 20 degrees. And that should be Relatively small answer, maybe like 30. Yes, and I, I dislike the inconsistency there, because I, I want things to be as consistent as possible. The problem is, your calculator doesn't understand the frame of reference, because it's just a machine that doesn't know what question you're working. If you, well, if you input negative 98 into your calculator, it would give you negative 33.5. And that negative doesn't really tell you anything for our answer because it points down the ramp. I suppose you could consider the negative to mean down the ramp, but it's an angled, slanted risk answer. So the negative doesn't really mean anything from a standard reference frame, unfortunately. You could keep it, you could have the negative on your answer, 
that all the negative really serves to do is tell you direction on your axis. And we already know the direction. It's going to be on this slanted line, specifically down the ramp. So that would be the only thing the negative would exist to tell you. And so sometimes in my work, I just I don't put it into my trig because it can interfere with what direction my trig answer, my calculator gives me, and it again doesn't understand the context. So I do sometimes take the negatives out before I do the trig, and then if I need them, I'll I have to put them back on myself afterwards. In this case, I would add the statement down the ramp to my answer, and that explains the direction part of this vector by itself. That's how I would do it. And in the web assign, on the few ramp questions that I put on the chapter four homework, web assign already knows what direction it's gonna point. It already asked you what is the acceleration of force down the ramp. So either if I'm grading it, that's a totally fine way of writing it. Web assign should have already factored that in. I'm rambling at this point, I apologize. Did I address the concern? Yeah. Okay. So this is the force down the ramp. Notice it is measurably smaller than gravity. You never slide down a ramp at the same speed you fall, well, the same acceleration you fall down the ramp because even though the ramp isn't flat and it's not holding you up perfectly, it's still preventing you from falling straight down through it. It's still working against gravity. So it makes sense that our answer is smaller than the box's weight. The only way, well, it could never be bigger than the box's weight because it's not pushing you down faster. It would only ever be equal to or equal to if there was no ramp and less than if there is a ramp. So this is our net force. We can utilize it with the mass determine the acceleration down the ramp. You can say law, net force equals mass times acceleration. Mass is 10 kilograms. So the acceleration would be, divide by 10, 3.35 meters per second squared. And we'll show that work. This is a vector two, it points down the ramp. Notice again, that acceleration is less than that of gravity, which again makes sense. We're not falling straight down, there's something in our way. So all the internal logic, all the um, that, that serves that can serve as a framework to let you know you found a good answer. Your acceleration down the ramp should not be more than gravity. How do you guys feel? This is admittedly a weird scenario. Like the trig involved or the logic needed to assemble this triangle and then use it is odd. There's no other way around it. I've been doing it for a while, so it makes sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense to you yet. We'll use it in lab next week. Uh, lab next week, we're going to start utilizing force and friction. Uh, we're going to, well, we're going to be measuring friction on a horizontal surface, and we will also be building ramps to analyze the forces while on an incline like this. So, Ponder this, let it sink in. We'll continue practicing next week. Questions, needs, concerns about anything? All right. We will break here for today. Um, we'll work on the chapter three stuff and let me know if you have any questions over the weekend. We'll discuss it before it is due on Monday. And have a wonderful weekend.